man. I'm not trying to sound all sultry. I don't feel very well this morning. So if you're new to First Christian, I'm not deliberately trying to hide from you in the corner. It's because I don't feel very well. And I, someone told me to put me in quarantine. So I said, well, I'll just stay in the back room. I didn't want to wear a mask. So I'm glad to see you this morning. Happy New Year. Can you hear me okay? You really can? Okay, because we can crank you up. I, I mean, I can... We can get this going. But it means every once in a while I'm going to drink some water. I'll do the best job I can. It hit me a couple days ago. And I didn't want to pull another fast one on the lane the night before and say, hey, honey. I see, eventually they're going to think I'm doing this on purpose. Uh, I want to do a quick sermon series. I want to pick up where David and Nanny uh, dropped off last week on, uh, on speak, sharing the gospel with people. And today in particular, I want to focus on something very important in the ministry and life of the church. It's not good news if you don't start with the bad news. So we will say, well, I got bad news and I got good news. It's not really good without bad news. Well, the bad news is there's full, this world is full of evil and sin. The problem is we're part of the problem. And we can blame Satan, demons, and whatever. But the problem is, the real problem is, the God's got that handled. The real problem is we're a big, cheap part of that problem. And whether this is popular to say or not, this is biblical. What God wants to do is to establish his reign, his rule in the world. That's what he wants to do. The problem is we're rebels. It's like we're fighting them before we come to Jesus. It's like we got guns pointed right at them and say, don't come near me. This is my land. This is my territory. Well, that's the problem. So if people say, why don't God just get rid of evil? That means get rid of you. I mean, do you see that? Get rid of you, get rid of me, because evil starts in us, in our own hearts and minds. So instead of just demolishing us all, he wanted to woo us more like a lover loves some more, making friends than just slaves. And so Jesus came, he'll defeat evil. He defeats evil by exercising demons out of people in his ministry. And of course, on the cross, he takes care of sin and evil's rule. That's been done. That's been settled. Now, stay with me for a second. We're looking at scripture a lot today. That is the bad news. The good news is Jesus has taken over. He's winning people's hearts and minds. And in his ministry, what he did was, if you don't know this, he called together several key people. And he said, come on, guys. God, I know you're a fisherman. You're this. You handle money. You might be a carpenter. You might be this or that. But I got a new job description. As if Jesus gave him a new, res- a new uh, job description and then he they give him a resume almost. And Jesus looks over and says, so you've been fishing for several years. You got several workers. Good for you. Pete, I got a new job for you. You're not going to be a fisherman, just a fisherman. I'm going to be a fisher of, of men. And so I'm going to give you a new job. You don't need to go to school for it right now, Peter and all the disciples. I'm going to give you on the job training. And I want to walk around and preach and teach and exercise demons and heal people and teach you how to do it. So as I usher in God's rule, God's kingdom, God's reign, they all mean the same thing. I want to train you. And he does. And at least two different occasions, he gets the disciples and says, now it's your turn. He sends them on a trial run. And they're successful. They preach the good news. Now, not one disciple has all of Jesus' powers. As a group, they have these skill sets that Jesus has. They come back and they're successful. And Jesus says, high five. Basically, he didn't really say high five, but he He says, way to go. He congratulates him. And then after his death and resurrection, he meets with that same group of people one more time. And look what he says in Matthew, in Matthew, let me skip ahead, in Matthew 28, to the very end of Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew 28, we've read this before, but it's one you want to keep reading over and over. In Matthew 28, he gets the same disciples together, except for Judas, because Judas is, he's gotten rid of his presence on the earth. So 11 disciples go to Galilee. In Matthew 28, Jesus says, All authority on on heaven and earth has been given to me. In verse 19, go. And I won't talk about the Greek there, but as you go, but go, therefore, and do what? Make disciples of all nations, not just of the Israelite Jews, but now all the Gentiles. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, And look, I'm with you all the way to the end of the age. I'm not abandoning you. So I train you to do the job, then I want you to go do it. And when you go do this to all the Gentiles, I'm with you. 
stay with me here because I know the average attention span six minutes. I'm, almost, I'm about three minutes into it. Stay with me. It is. I look on the average time sermons are watched on the website, seven minutes. That's the average time watched, seven minutes. And here in the church, I, I can tell it takes about five minutes to see dozing off. Stay with me for a second. It does, especially my voice. I'm sure it doesn't help. I can't scream and holler. I don't usually scream and holler. That's what happens. Jesus trains his people. And then after his death and resurrection, they go do it. The book of Acts is full of stories of disciples making other disciples. Jesus wanted a multiplication process. I want you to go share the gospel. That's baptizing them. That's evangelism. Share the gospel. And I'll talk about that more in a second. And then I want you to help them grow up, teach them everything I obey. My own children, we had to give them birth. Not we, sorry, honey. Elaine did. Uh, but I was there. Uh, Elaine, we had to give them birth, and then we helped them grow up. And then several different authors in the New Testament talk about that excitement of sharing the gospel. Turn to Romans 1. We read that earlier. Romans chapter 1. The Apostle Paul talks about his efforts to do this very same thing, to share the gospel with people. In Romans 1.16, do you have your Bible open there, a Bible app? Either one. Romans 1.16. I hate to do just a couple verses out of context, but we don't have time for the whole document. Romans 1.16, you have that, amen? Stay with me here. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the what? Gospel. It is the power of God. That's why he's not ashamed of it. There's power in the gospel for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He is not ashamed of it ever, 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 ever. Now, I want to say a few things about this. And the first thing is this. When our Lord Jesus, if let me say it this way, because some of you, this isn't true for some of you probably. When you make Jesus the Lord, and you don't make him Lord and then later a Savior, it's both and. When he's your Lord, he's your boss, period. That means your number one goal in life is to make him happy, to have a love relationship with him where he's pleased. That means this is the main thing we're supposed to be doing. So read this with me. Read this with me. Read this with me. You ready? Stay focused. The main thing hasn't changed. Some of y'all don't believe me yet. That's for, you're not going to read out loud. Try one more time. I won't, I won't give you a second chance. Here we go. Stay focused. The main thing hasn't changed. Churches get this all kinds of messed up. We don't have the prerogative to change the mission of his church. It's not yours. It's not mine. Does that make sense? We don't have the prerogative. We don't. I've not died for anybody's sins, and you haven't either. This is not ours. It's his. And the main thing hasn't changed We've got to stay focused on this main thing. It reminds me, I like reading about organizational leadership. And you can read these massive organizational transformations. And some are legendary. Like the Apple company, Macintosh, Mac Computers, and Apple. Many of you might know the story. When Steve Jobs and others helped found the company, and it became a gargantuan success, the board of Apple eventually fired him. They said, you're too young to handle the success. So the guy who started it get fired by a bunch of older people who said, he's too young, can't handle it. Right after that, the company starts going down in sales and they start opening up, starting new different chains, new different products, pro chains of products, so different things. Well, they get spread thin and the company starts tanking. And they bring in different leaders and it keeps tanking. And eventually they say, come on back, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, knock all that other junk off and do what? Get focused on the main thing. They build one particular Mac computer that changes the entire market. And a little later on, they develop the iPod, which changes everything. They get to stay focused. IBM, Chips, was the main leader. They eventually got spread out too thin. The new CEO came back up, said, what are we good at? Get focused on the main thing. I can give you company after company. Churches are like that, too, in that they can get so thin and think that our main job is a bunch of other things. So Christians, sisters, brothers, please, 
let's stay focused. Not only as a church, but in our own lives. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, the gospel itself, if that's the main thing, is, read this with me because of my voice. The gospel is the declaration that God's loving, redemptive rule is being established in people's lives when they respond in faith to Jesus. Evil's rule has been broken. Sin's rule has been broken. Jesus did not say, listen, please listen. He did not say, go into all the world and invite people to church. And for a lot of people, that's what I think evangelism means, inviting people to church. So then the preacher is the one who talk about Jesus. He didn't say, go into all the world and tell people how to get to heaven. Didn't say that either. Jesus was not about that. He was about God's rule being established in people. And when a person responds in faith to Jesus, we say, I got a new boss. And that's one of the reasons why the gospel is so offensive. Because we don't want a boss. American dream. I'm a self-made man. And we don't want that stuff. Until we realize we're corrupt. And we need a savior. But it is a declaration. It's not an invitation to see whether or not it hurts Mike's feelings. I don't want to offend you. Jesus said this. And all the early church said this. It was an announcement it was an announcement that God's rule is being established. Now, we're amongst friends. Let me ask you a question. And just seriously. Raise your hand if you really care about sharing the gospel with people. You regularly, routinely look for ways to share the gospel. Regularly, routinely look for ways to share the gospel. Okay, most people not. Which means most people, of course, are not sharing the gospel. And that's true for most Christians around the world, as you know that. Most Christians, they care, but they don't really care. Therefore, they don't what? They don't do it. It reminds me of eating well and going to the gym. That's the average person. They'll say, it's important. I care about it. But they don't really care. They eat donuts every day. <laughs> or eat McDonald's every day. Um, they care about eating well and being in good shape, but they don't really care. They don't make changes in their lifestyle based on that value. Thus, they don't do it. But you know who does go to the gym and care about fitness all the time? People who almost died. When the doctor comes to you and says, if you don't go work out and change your lifestyle right now, you've only got a few months to live. Cancer patients do this very often. And you know they really care? Because you know why, Greg, of course? Because death is about to happen. And when they've been saved from dying, they become a huge advocate. What you don't hear these people say is, that's just, you know, I know it's a personal struggle. These people go out of their way to tell everybody they know about the benefits of being healthy. When you've been saved from death, you want to tell everybody. And you notice how it's a lifestyle change. No one goes and just drinks a few more glasses of water. It's the whole show. My brother has, has cholesterol or something a long time was pretty high, and so he started getting really healthy. He lost a lot of weight. He called it the death diet. <laughs> and I said, that'd be a good bookseller. It's pretty depressing, but it's true. There's nothing like motivating you when you're going to be safe from death. So why is it, Christians? Why is it, Christians, we don't really try deliberately all the time sugar to go? Why is Why is that? If you've been saved by Jesus, you've been saved a far worse than physical death, right? If you know the gospel, that's true. Why is it so much easier to claim allegiance to anything else besides him? I noticed in Lawrence, and I noticed some in this church, but in, I think it's a country cultural thing. It's so much easier to claim political allegiance than religious allegiance. I hear it all the time. Um, when I first came here, well, this is this is a long time ago. There was a person here who was a guest, and she said, you know, Pastor, I don't, that's a sad story, but I think you ought to know it. 
She said, um, I found out that one of the guys who goes to your church, his daughter, I think I work with her, kind of a similar field. And I went up and saw her and I said, hey, I'm paraphrasing, hey, guess what? I've, I've been going to your dad's church and your church. She said she looked at the woman and went, well, my family is very liberal and my dad can't stand that new minister and all those changes he's making. I thought several things. Well, the first thing I thought was, isn't it amazing? You talk to a stranger, the first thing out of their mouth is, I'm, my family is very liberal. The other day I was having a conversation with some people and we were talking about some other ethical issues and the guy said, well, I'm very, I'm conservative. People, and that's common in this culture. They don't have any problem saying that usually having those kinds of things. Why is that? I'm not going to answer the question for you. If that's true for you, why is it? What is it? Paul said, I'm not ashamed. It's the power of God. Those words, that gospel changes lives. Why is it so much easier? The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, flip over there if you can, 1 Corinthians 1, the Corinthians have a different problem. 1 Corinthians 1. There are certain people in the Corinthian congregation who apparently think their great education and wisdom gives them greater insight to what God is doing. They're kind of above it all. And Paul has to address them. He says, and I'm going to skip that all the way down to verse, what did I say, verse 28. Well, actually, we're going to, um, no, we're going to go back to verse 22. Let's do in verse 22 uh, because of time. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and Greeks. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. It's a stumbling block to Jews, and it's nonsense to Gentiles. Why is that? It's a stumbling block, something that it trips you up because Jesus was crucified. And everybody knows Messiahs don't get killed. And so the Jews would debate other Jews all the time who said, there's no way. There's no way God can show his power and salvation through a guy who came and got killed by the enemies. There's no way that can happen. And then the Gentiles, a whole other category, say, this is just stupid. Let's be honest. This is stupid. This is just nonsense. Messiah, this is ridiculous. Gods don't come down and die on crosses. And he goes on to say in verse 26, for consider your call, brethren. Many of you were wise and worldly standards, but many were powerful. Not many were noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring in nothing that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life. He is the source of your life. God wants some fools. <laughs> God wants some fools. God wants some people to trip people up from their sinful thinking. That's what he wants. It might seem so foolish. Is that one of the reasons why you don't share the gospel with people? You're afraid of looking foolish? That's a very common one I hear. Well, David, what if I ask something I don't know? I'll look foolish. But that's what God wants. I thought about calling the sermon, God wants some fools. That's what he wants. A lot of us are too ashamed of that to be look foolish, right? Because our pride, our ego is at stake too much. Other times, we don't want to trip people up. We don't want to think too differently from other people because we think different thoughts than they do, and we become a stumbling block. We'll look out of step. And then we get around people who are just so smart and so educated, and we go, well, what do I say around them? What do I do? Am I ashamed? Am I ashamed of the gospel? If so, what? Really, I'm asking you to ask yourself, if you're ashamed of the gospel, what is it? Why? Are you afraid of looking foolish? Why is that? Am I afraid of looking too different from culture? Why is that? What is it? I'm not here to answer that for you. I'm encouraging you to ask those same questions. What is it? 
about God's reign bursting in hearts and lives of people one at a time, setting us free from sin. Why is that so embarrassing? Why is it so hard to talk about with people? What is it? Here's some things I want you to write down. Here's my challenge for you, and I'm done. Here's my challenge. If you would, I always encourage you to write down your sermon notes or what the song says, the prayer. I don't care, but here's, here's some steps to help you. If you have a hard time sharing the gospel or caring about it, here's my steps for you. I do this myself, and this has helped me tremendously change my own heart and mind. First off, I pray and I ask God to help me care about it like he does. You say in your own vocabulary, whatever, how you want to talk about it. But I say, help me have my love for other people like he does. I do ask God, please help me see other people like you see them. Help me love them the same way so that I love them so much, I want to tell them the truth. Two, right now, write down the names of people you know who don't know Jesus or you think don't know Jesus. You're not condemning them to hell. This isn't a judgment list. It's people you think for sure don't know Jesus. Write them down. Can you think of people right now? I've got a list of people I pray for regularly because I know who they are. I know most of them because I ask them. I've asked them. Do you have a religious practices? Do you believe in God or whatever? I don't know. I'm an atheist. Okay, boom, you go on my list. They don't know that, but I got a list of them. And then I commit to praying for them. Commit to praying for them. At staff meeting here at the church, every week, almost every week, we pray for our list. I have the staff do the same thing. And we have names around the table, people. We're praying for them to come to know Jesus. I routinely do that. And the last one makes some of you introverts the most scared. Ask God to give you wisdom on when and how you can share the gospel in the conversation. Notice how I have never said to share the gospel, you got to be a foreign missionary. We need foreign missionaries, but that's not what all God needs. He needs disciples caring about making other disciples. So in normal conversations, you're asking God for ways to talk about it. And I call that directional relationships. When someone does know Jesus, I do want to form a relationship. I want to go somewhere. Now, why would I do such a thing? Because I love them. I care about them. I'm not built. I'm not getting known just to use them because I'm not getting like a chalk on my Bible. There's another one. There's no, no, it's not about me. It's because I care about them. I care about them. Much like a person, and I've met these people who now their lives have been changed from cancer because they worked out, changed their diet. They can't wait to tell me about the new diet program they started and how it changed their lives. I do this almost all the time. And I, in my last several years of my life, I've gotten better. But it took me a long time to get to this place. When I work out at the gym, when I see new people, if they're working out near me for a while, I pray for that person. And they don't know it, but I do. God does. And this isn't bragging. I'm, just, I'm being real with you. This is what I do. I practice the same stuff. I pray for the person. If they don't know him, they would, uh, I would say, Jesus, if this person doesn't know you, please help them to come know you. Give me a chance to say something if today's the day. Sometimes people are kind of in the mood. They don't look like they want to be interrupted. Sometimes a little more slower. And so, I, God, if you want me to talk to that person today, move in me and let me know. And sometimes I felt like he said, say something, and I chickened out. Sometimes I'm like, nah, today's, nah, I don't know. And some told me I should have. But other times he says, go. So I take out my headphones, go there and talk to him. Hey, which, hi, I'm David. They're going to look at me crazy. And hi, I'm, I'm Bob. What's up? Hey, man, how you do here? And I start, I listen, I talk, have a conversation with him. What do you do here? What's going on Lawrence? And so forth. And at some point, a lot of times, they'll say, what do you do here? Well, that's a little easy because I say, well, I work at a church. But before they talk about me, I usually ask a lot about them. And then ask if they go to church anywhere or do they have a certain faith anywhere about anything. I'll ask them about that. Um... If I'm at the grocery store, I'll do the same thing. If I see people a couple of time in the line, or maybe they're like in a certain magazine, I look around and I pray for them and I do the same thing. God, give me with in a conversation. When I meet with people at church, people who visit the church, I pray for that all the time. God, give me wisdom. If there's a chance to share the gospel, let me do it. And there are many times I don't feel like he said a word to me. But other times he does, and there's my chance. And we don't know if in the moment they're going to bow their neck and come to the cross. What I know is I need to be prepared and equipped to share with the gospel anytime I can. Does that make sense? Jesus never calls us all to have the spiritual gift of evangelism. 
I think David Nanny has that. Maybe some other of you do have the spiritual gift of it. There's a deep skill set and passion that just emanates from them. I don't think I have that. So I have to work a little harder. And I want to rely on people with the spiritual gift to let them train me on how to do it as well. And so I have to, I've read books on people who know how to do it well. And I practice too. Does that make sense what we're saying? How many of you wrote down some names of people right now that you know? How many people this service wrote down some names of people you're going to pray for? One person, two people, three. I think of those three people. I hope the rest of you will write down names of people you don't know. Now, here's what I'm going to do, and we're done. <laughs> I did this when I first came to church here, and this one guy told me it highly offended him, so I might offend some of y'all again. I'm going to ask you that if you will commit to doing with these basic things, looking for names of people you know, praying for them, and look for opportunities to pray for people in conversations, and don't, don't do this if you don't mean it. It's okay, and there's no shame involved. I just want to see that you're not alone when you do this. Will you stand up? Will you stand up now if you commit to asking God to help you have more of a heart like his and to start praying for people who don't know Jesus? You don't have to stand up if you don't mean it. You don't have to stand up if you don't mean it. I didn't ask you to stand up if you're doing world missions. I didn't ask that. I just asking God for a heart like his to start asking, say, how can I start praying for these people and I want to start doing my best to ask God for wisdom and how to have conversations with people. We're going to sing a song in a little bit, which I love, called Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And sisters and brothers, you're not alone. We have nothing to be ashamed of. We have nothing to be afraid of. We have nothing at all to be afraid of. God's going to do something great in our lives in 2018. And it starts for us staying focused on the main thing. Amen. Let's stay focused on the main thing. Let me pray together.